Today, our presenter is Jerry Holzbecker. In 1999, Jerry graduated from the University of British Columbia with an honors environmental science degree, specializing in chemistry. Jerry has been with ALS since 2002 and supervised the Trace Organics Extractions team in the centralized soil preparation area. He has extensive experience as an account manager, mobile laboratory analyst, laboratory lead analyst in the Trace Organics lab, and years of experience as an analyst in the water quality lab. Since 2011, Jerry has been the client services manager at our ALS laboratory in Vancouver and oversees the account manager team. And today, Jerry will be discussing the benefits of reduced soil gas sampling volumes for thermal desorption. Jerry, thank you for taking your time today to deliver this presentation. I will go ahead and turn it over to you. <clears throat> All right, thanks, Kelly, um, for the kind words. Um, I'm not used to that kind of an introduction, so. Um, and I'm also, um, it's my first time doing webinars, so uh, very excited to be here. And I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us uh, for today's uh, webinar on the benefits of reduced soil gas sampling volumes uh, for thermal desorption. Now, typically, uh, it's the pursuit of every industry leading lab to miniaturize or reduce sampling volumes um, for all the tests that they offer. And the reduction of the sample volumes are associated with a quadruple bottom line. and um, this is associated with improvements in safety, sustainability, quality, and cost. Uh, if I didn't have you at safety, I should at least have you at saving money, right? So uh, my presentation today is gonna look at how the reduction of soil gas sampling volumes align with um, some of the guidance documents in BC and Canada. And then we're gonna take a look at the benefits associated with those reduced sampling volumes. All right, so, the presentation is going to look at vapor intrusion monitoring guidance documents, the emergence of these documents, and we're just going to try and relate how um, the reduction of soil gas volumes align with the guidance contained uh, in the material. Uh, and then we're going to take a close look at the methods for soil gas sampling and analysis, but specifically focusing in on TD. Um, and then once we're all familiar with the TD method, uh, we'll take a look at the benefits of reducing soil gas sampling volumes. Uh, and these benefits, which are really perceived by ALS, there could be more than these, but uh, these are the ones we're going to focus on for the presentation, include uh, reduced sampling time, reduced overloading of both the TD tube and the instrument, uh, improve, improved safe sampling volume management, uh, reduced moisture effects, and then improved vacuum management uh, during sampling at the well. All right. So without further ado, uh, in the beginning, the availability of guidance documents for vapor intrusion monitoring was quite limited. And it wasn't until the need to monitor and regulate vapor intrusion became realized and adopted that we began to see um, the emergence of these guidance materials. Uh, if we go to the beginning in Canada in 2008, uh, Geosyntec was contracted by CCME to release a scoping assessment of soil vapor monitoring protocols. And in 2011, uh, Golder released their guidance on site characterization for the evaluation of soil vapor intrusion into buildings. Neither of these documents were officially adopted by these jurisdictional bodies, but they served as important beacons to guide best practice throughout the industry. <clears throat> In 2016, CCME followed up with their guidance manuals. So there were a few sections in these manuals uh, that included uh, extensive sections on vapor intrusion monitoring and soil vapor sampling. And then in 2019, most recently, BCEMV uh, posted SOP D1-11, which is uh, just um, an addition to the field sampling manual uh, and includes soil vapor uh, sampling guidance. Uh, something that isn't shown here, but is worth noting for anybody joining us from Eastern Canada, um, <clears throat> the current guidance documents in Ontario is the 2013 uh, draft technical guidance on soil vapor intrusion monitoring. Uh, and, and also very interestingly, uh, it was Golder and Geosyntec that, that worked on this document. And I think as the industry involves, we're gonna see the evolution uh, of best practice and I think we'll continue to see improved um, knowledge and technology as well. So what we did is we went through these guidance documents and we just tried to cherry pick some of the most relevant items um, 
that relates to the, the lab testing. Uh, these guidance documents are very extensive and they cover many aspects of vapor intrusion monitoring and, and that would include things like conceptual modeling, well installations, well development, sampling and more. So uh, the first thing that we wanted to talk about from these guidance documents uh, was that it's important for you to choose a method that satisfies your data quality objectives. So uh, that is to say, um, you really need to consider analyte compatibility when it comes to choosing a uh, soil vapor intrusion method, uh, monitoring method. Uh, an example of this would be, uh, let's just say, for reduced sulfur compounds. So if you're going to be working with ALS, uh, the only sampling methods we offer for those analytes uh, is ba uh, TD bag. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, it's uh, SUMA canisters or uh, Tedlar bags. Um, we don't offer that test by any other method, so uh, we couldn't do it by TD or by any other absorption tube. Uh, Another important point, and probably one of the most important points when it comes to the laboratory and the guidance documents, is that consultation with the lab is essential. So specifically, depending on the method you choose, in order to meet your uh, data objectives, uh, you'll need to know what your sampling volumes or sampling times need to be. Uh, and then there are many other considerations that are worth discussing with your lab. So that would include what exactly are the detection limits, quality protocols, and even handling and transport of samples to and from the lab. Uh, and the last thing we're just gonna, we're gonna highlight is that it's important for anybody working on uh, really with, with any data that the lab produces is to ensure the analytical method is approved for use. So in BC and in Ontario, uh, these are the regions that I know of, that uh, any data point that's produced by the lab can only be compared to regulatory criteria if that method is approved for use. Um, by those uh, regulatory bodies. So just a due diligence thing, make sure that you call in uh, and have a discussion with your lab and make sure that those methods are good to go. Okay, I'm just gonna back it up for a second here. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that um, all of these, um, I guess, sampling devices that are shown on the right, are used extensively uh, for air sampling in Canada. Uh, when it comes to soil vapor intrusion monitoring uh, and soil vapor sampling, uh, in Canada, ALS predominantly works with the, the canisters and TD, but we're going to focus in on TD since this is what the presentation is about. So I'm just going to go over some of the, the basics of the TD method, explain what's involved. Uh, so thermal desorption employs a sorbent trap typically uh, in a tube, and it's uh, the tube is used to collect analytes of interest. They adsorb onto the media that are designed to capture them contained in the tube. And once the analytes are trapped on the media, they are sent to the lab for analysis using methods validated to desorb and quantify the targeted analytes. In Canada, ALS works with the Perkin Elmer SVI TD tube. Uh, the tube contains multiple sorbent beds that act as a molecular, molecular sieve to trap gaseous VOCs. The uh, one very important note is that uh, the uh, sample volume is a critical element in determining final data. So it's used in conjunction with the laboratory detection limits in order to achieve final data. Um, if there are any inaccuracies in the sample volume, this will result uh, directly result in inaccuracies to the data. So it's critical that the sample volume is collected accurately and, and that volume is known uh, and shared with the lab. Uh, over time, the, the thermal desorption instruments um, have advanced significantly. In the beginning, recollection of samples wasn't always possible and it's just over time that now we typically see this as a, uh, a feature on all TD models. So what this allows for is after initial analysis, uh, the laboratory can perform dilutions or reanalysis to confirm results. And quality is always important. Uh, ALS Vancouver uh, cleans and proofs each tube prior to reuse. So we just ensure that the, the tubes are free of any artifacts prior to the lab sending them out for to the field for reuse. Okay, so in order to draw a known volume of air through the tube, 
Uh, pump is normally employed. Uh, ALS Vancouver supplies our clients with calibrated pumps. Um, and we configure the sampling train to the exact configuration uh, that we're provided with. Uh, this isn't necessarily the case for, for all labs. So in some cases, we work with our partners that have their own pumps or uh, pumps are obtained from a third party uh, for the sampling events. Uh, I think it's critical in all cases that the calibration be conducted to the media uh, that's going to be used. So normally the labs would supply um, a calibration tube uh, with the sampling equipment. Um, and if you haven't seen one before, then you should just request one. Uh, ALS Vancouver will calibrate and verify the flows to the media uh, prior to the delivery um, or prior to us sending the, the sampling equipment out. And we also verify it upon return. But it is absolutely critical that the verification of the flow be conducted in situ during sampling. So. Um, the configuration shown here is just a pre-post sampling event. So the schematic is showing that the flow verification uh, is hooked up ahead of the media. This wouldn't be compatible with uh, verification of flow during sampling. So in order to uh, configure this uh, sampling train correctly, correctly, the flow meter would have to be moved behind the media just to ensure the sample isn't flowing through the flow meter prior to being collected uh, by the sampling tubes. Okay, so once the sample is collected, it's sent to the lab for analysis. Uh, the first thing the lab does uh, in Vancouver here is we dry purge uh, the TD tube. So this removes excess moisture. Uh, once the sample is dry purged, it's loaded onto the TD unit. So um, within the TD unit, there is something called a cold trap. Uh, and the cold trap, essentially refocuses all of the contaminants off the TD tube. So uh, the TD tube is thermally desorbed and the contamination is refocused onto the cold trap. Once fully focused onto the cold trap, uh, it's desorbed again and split two ways. So uh, a large portion of the sample is recollected back onto the original TD tube. Uh, and then a portion is introduced into the instrument for analysis where it's simultaneously analyzed for aggregate parameters like VHV, F1, uh, TVOC by FID, which is flame ionization detection, and then discrete analysis uh, for uh, parameters like BTEX uh, by GCMS. Uh, before I move on, I just wanted to highlight that uh, um, each uh, of the components in, in the TD unit and the instrument. So what I'm talking about is the cold trap um, and these uh, columns. So the FID column and the GCMS column, they have a finite capacity for loading uh, and then essentially desorbing the contaminants in the same run. If uh, the contamination in the tubes is so high, so if the VOC loading is so high that um, the cold trap and the columns can't fully desorb that uh, those parameters or those contaminants in the in the same analytical run. Uh, this will severely impact data quality, and we'll talk about those more specifically in just a little bit when we're when we get into the the benefits of reduced sample volume. Okay, so now that you guys are all experts on the TD method, uh, we can take a closer look at how reducing. Uh, soil gas sampling volumes for TD has uh, benefits. Uh, this includes reduced sampling time, reduced overloading, uh, improved safe sampling volume management, uh, improved vacuum management at the well, and then reduced moisture effects. Okay, so this is probably one of the, the biggest improvements for, I would say, field staff especially. Historically, ALS required three liters of sample in order to meet our criteria in BC. So that's ALS Vancouver. Uh, three liters of sample meant that you were sampling over a 30 minute time frame if you were able to achieve 100 mils per minute. This has now been reduced to five minutes. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback from uh, our partners that are already using uh, our TD method uh, and obtaining samples in five minutes. They're saying there's huge efficiency gains for their field staff. 
Uh, and the five minute sample or the 500 mil sample will meet all of the BC vapor standards for all land uses. Um, the linear range of the method is incredibly dynamic. So in some cases, uh, additional sample volume may need to be taken uh, for time weighted averages or if the zone of influence wants to be increased, like if, if, if um, just a, a larger sample, so zone of influence in the well um, is to be increased, uh, the method can actually still handle the three liter sample volume and beyond. Uh, and then reduce sample flows. So the tube specifications require that uh, the minimum flow through the tubes is 20 mils per minute. And so this would mean that you can still achieve a sample uh, in less time than it originally took uh, for us to obtain a three liter sample. So at 20 mils per minute, a sample takes 25 minutes. All right, I think this is one of the most important improvements for the lab. Uh, and probably where I'm going to spend most of my time uh, talking about improvements. Uh, TD tube capacity and overloading has historically plagued uh, the TD method, uh, for our lab anyway, and we know that uh, uh, it has uh, impacted our partners as well. So I'm just going to start by talking about tube capacity. The TD tube capacity is about 20,000 micrograms. Uh, ALS Vancouver conducted a study where we we analyzed some uh, pure gasoline, and we found that uh, contaminants start to break through once you pass that 20,000 microgram VOC loading. So at 22,000 micrograms, we saw about 0.1% breakthrough, and at 28,000 micrograms, we saw about 24% breakthrough. So, I mean, in general, high VOC loading is bad for everybody, uh, not just uh, anybody who needs data, um, by a certain deadline, but also for the lab because it affects the equipment. Uh, when the tube is overloaded, this means that you're gonna see minimum values. Uh, it means that we can't report actual numbers because we know that there is the potential, uh, high potential for that breakthrough to have occurred. And minimum values will also occur uh, if you exceed the maximum dilution. So uh, if your results are so high that we cannot dilute them into range uh, for quantification, we will just be reporting uh, a minimum value for your data uh, as high as we can quantify. Uh, the other issue with high VOCs is that uh, there's a chance that you're gonna invalidate the recollection. Uh, or that you're going to see carryover contamination uh, into subsequent runs. So uh, what I had talked about earlier was if the cold trap is, is overloaded and cannot clean itself in the analytical run, the residue that remains on the cold trap will be carried over into the next run, and then that residue will be recollected as part of that recollection step onto the tubes. So essentially what happens is uh, that excessive contamination not only uh, invalidates the data that we obtain uh, from the subsequent runs, it also invalidates the recollection, which means we can't even report data uh, for those samples. Now, historically, the way ALS in Vancouver ha has overcome this problem is that when we're working with clients who are going to a well, uh, with unknown contamination concentrations or where they know the concentrations are high, we ask them to take uh, a full three liter sample and then a one minute sample. But this is this, this can now essentially be overcome with just some basic communication. So we really only need to leave a few blank spots behind an unknown sample or behind a highly contaminated sample to ensure that we don't affect any other samples and that we're able to obtain data or uh, dilute that high sample in the future runs. Uh, and one last thing to mention is uh, in extreme cases, um, if the TD tube is affected by high VOCs and we cannot clean it, uh, there's normally replacement fees associated with that. Okay, and this is just uh, giving you guys an idea of what a highly loaded VOC sample looks like. This isn't even that extreme, but uh, the next slide is just a blank tube showing the carryover uh, and what it looks like. Uh, in the worst cases, we've had entire runs wiped out uh, and long discussions with our partners about uh, having to go back to the field to resample. Uh, so, you know, we are very relieved that we are past this. 
<clears throat> and this is just showing you chromatogram of a saturated toluene peak. So that flat top means obviously we're missing some of the contamination in our calculation. Uh, we normally calculate results from those Gaussian shaped peaks on the left uh, to get you your final data. Okay, so safe sampling volumes. Uh, I just wanted to quickly define this for everybody so they know what we're talking about. Uh, with the reduced sample volume, so around 500 mils, we're gonna see an improvement in management of safe sampling volumes. Uh, and it's just a measure of the volume of air that can be safely sampled before analyte breakthrough. This is not the same as uh, overloading the tube. Uh, so when you think of the tube, uh, you have to think of the analytes absorbing to the media. Um, and the lighter compounds, <clears throat> the tubes essentially have a, a looser grip on those lighter compounds. And the light compounds will tend to just slide through uh, over time. So the more air you sample, the further along those analytes slide within the tube until they eventually break through the other side. So uh, ALS tested... Um, essentially safe sampling volumes for all of our parameters that we report. Uh, and we did it at 70% relative humidity and found that chloromethane had the lowest safe sampling volume. So uh, at six liters, uh, we can no longer confidently report uh, the data uh, without there being a chance of breakthrough. Um, and with the 500 mil sample, this is now uh, less than, 10% uh, of the lowest SSV, and essentially almost all VOCs are now less than 1% uh, of this sampling volume. So there is essentially uh, no risk of exceeding safe sampling volumes as long as you're managing that uh, sampling volume to less than six liters. All right, uh, managing vacuum. So we do see great improvements to uh, managing vacuum on site. Uh, the best practice, according to the guidance documents, is to ensure that during the sampling, uh, vacuum doesn't exceed 10 inches of water. Um, reduced vacuum during sampling or increased vacuum means that you're increasing the probability of short circuiting and annular, annular leakage. Uh, and you may also be increasing the chances of contributions from unwanted sources through vaporization and volatilization. Uh, historically, within the industry, the strategies to overcome vacuum is just to reduce the flow. As I mentioned earlier, the, the, the tubes can be used at a flow rate as low as 20 mils per minute. Uh, so if the well can deliver uh, this flow rate, it means you can still obtain samples within 25 minutes. And finally, uh, one of the last benefits we want to talk about, highlight today, is that uh, with the lowered sample volume, we see reduced effects from moisture. Um, moisture hasn't been as problematic as high VOC loading, I would say, in the past, but uh, it does interfere with TD analysis. So what we see is the suppression of responses for the lighter VOCs, and then uh, really wet samples, I would say, extinguish the FID. So uh, this means we can't obtain data from that run and we'd have to go back and reanalyze. Uh, this of course causes delays for our partners uh, and is extremely problematic when there are critical deadlines to be met. So uh, with the reduced volumes coupled with um, the dry purge, uh, we've essentially eliminated any of these uh, moisture complications. <clears throat> As I had mentioned uh, near the beginning, ALS Canada works with both canisters and TD uh, for soil gas sampling. Uh, and I think it wouldn't be fair uh, to leave uh, canisters out of this presentation. Uh, I think uh, I just wanna highlight the fact that whole gas sampling, so canisters obtain whole gas samples, uh, it's a huge benefit uh, when you're comparing it to DD, TD in, in the sense that it's not selective and is a much more rugged method. Uh, you don't have to deal with any of the issues of overloading uh, and also the safe sampling volume <clears throat> uh, issues you ran into earlier just don't come into play. Um, but canisters also have their drawbacks. I would say, as with anything that's high quality, you have to pay for it. So canister analysis is 
typically comes at a higher cost, but uh, the difference between TD and canisters uh, in terms of prices has really narrowed over the years. Uh, and canisters take up a much larger footprint. So the space that they take uh, is large. Uh, if you compare the amount of equipment you have to take out in the field for, let's just say, five or 10 samples, uh, canisters would occupy a few coolers, but you know you can take the equipment for TD out in, in just a couple of Pelican cases. I think we can do a whole presentation just comparing these two methods, and I just wanted to briefly highlight uh, some of the pros and cons uh, of canisters versus TD here. Um, so that's really all I wanted to discuss today. And in conclusion, uh, just going over the improvements again, uh, in BC, you can now collect one to 500 mil sample uh, to meet the, the BC EMV vapor standards. Um, this is now a five minute sampling time at 100 mils per minute. Overloading issues with the tube and at the instrument are virtually eliminated and there's near zero risk of exceeding safe sampling volumes. Uh, reduced moisture impacts uh, improve analytical data quality and we also see improved vacuum management at the well. All right, thanks for your attention everybody and I guess we're gonna uh, open up the floor for questions. Yes, thank you, Jerry. We will go ahead and open up for questions. As a reminder, you can either write out your question in the chat pod below on the bottom right, or you can update your status to raise your hand if you want to verbally ask Jerry a question. We will give everyone a few moments so they can collect their thoughts. All right, I don't see any additional questions coming in. Um, I do want to thank everyone for attending with us today and enjoy the rest of your week.